Hello, Rob Venn here. Today we're going to be looking at representations in music videos. So, we're going to be looking at the theories of Walter Lippmann, Richard Dyer, Sarah Thornton, Carl Rogers, Paul Willis. Um, obviously, I'm going to be wanting you to mention all of these in your evaluation, in your analysis. Uh, we're also going to be looking at UK music tribes and subcultures. So, representation, what is it? Well, the media doesn't show us reality. It shows us a filtered version of reality. It takes reality and it represents it to us. Hence, re representation. We call this process mediation. The process of being filtered through the media. So bear in mind, whenever you're watching the media, you're not looking at an objective reality. You're looking at someone's opinion. Now, we need to consider the kind of representations you're going to see in a music video. Obviously, you're going to have music subcultures being represented. Um, you've got age, youth in particular, in youth culture. We're going to have representations of gender, race and sexuality, depending on what kind of video it is. Now, in particular, we're going to need to be considering the concept of the stereotype. You may remember that this theory comes from Walter Lippmann in 1922. How do we define stereotypes? Well, they're a preconceived and oversimplified idea of the characteristics which typify a person, situation, group of people, etc. It's also the attitude based on such a preconception, or a person who appears to conform closely to the idea of a type. Just because they're oversimplified, however, doesn't mean to say there's not an element of truth in them, otherwise they wouldn't exist in the first place. Richard Dyer went a little bit further in 1977. He identified the difference between in-groups and out-groups. In-groups are people who are stereotyped as being like us. They're one of us. People who belong. Out-groups are people who don't belong. We can talk about the idea of the parent culture. The parent culture isn't necessarily the culture of our parents, although it might be. But it's the mainstream, ordinary, middle of the road ideas, beliefs, behaviours of your culture. Anyone who doesn't conform to that is an outgroup. Within that culture, we have subcultures. They are cultures within cultures. So a subculture is an identifiable subgroup within a society or group of people. They will be characterised by shared beliefs or interests or hobbies or whatever. But these will be at variance with those of the larger group. Their behaviour is not considered, in inverted commas, normal, mainstream. Um, they will have distinctive ideas, practices, ways of life that are associated with that subculture. Not that subgroup could come from anywhere. It could be a religious subculture. It could be a, you know, a political subculture. Um, it could be surrounding, you know, a hobby or a, you know, a pastime. And which is where music comes in. Music subcultures are one of the most common and one of the most spectacular and easily identifiable. And they're very important for young people. Young people have often, throughout history, certainly in the history of the 20th century, used pop music to differentiate themselves from the parent culture. Uh, these subcultures will have their own way of dressing, their own way of acting, their own language, you know, their slang. You know, they have their own dances, they'll have their own drugs, they will have their own way of behaving. This is often seen as being a folk devil by the parent culture. There'll be moral panics, um, you know, youth gone wild kind of attitude obviously a lot of subcultures like to think of themselves as independent like to think of themselves as different uh, as rebellious but you know they're still conforming they're conforming to a stereotype it may be a subcultural stereotype but it's a stereotype we want to do this we have an innate desire to fit in. Now, we may not want to fit in with the overall herd, but we need to find our tribe. We need to find people who are like us. And that's why youth cultures in particular will have a uniform. 
you know, they will have certain kinds of clothing they wear, certain kinds of haircut, you know, emo kids here with their, you know, their fringes and their makeup and their black clothing, you know, it's about fitting in whilst also rebelling. Now, a few years ago, um, well, last year really, Channel 4 did a nationwide survey into youth subcultures and identified all sorts of different youth subcultures in this country um, and these are the ones that surrounded music there as you can see are five main youth subcultures each of course will have its own subcategories the first one is the young alts young alternatives in other words they include you know the really rebellious types um, your rockers, your metalheads, your emos, your scene kids, your goths, your hardcores, your skaters, the people who don't want to fit in, the rebels. At least I like to think of themselves as rebels anyway. You've got your mainstream, your townies, your chavas, your chavs, you know, people who like mainstream top 40 dance music, you know, your fangirls, blingers who are particularly into pop. You've got your leading edge. These are your indie scenesters, your hipsters. You know, they might like electronic, indie, folky kind of music. They're the avant-garde. The, that means the um, the forward edge, the leading edge, the cutting edge. You know, the kind of people who might like really obscure, weird stuff. And then you got your urban kids, your stylers. They're like your R&B, hip-hop types. And then you got your aspirants. They aspire to something. They're the new casuals. They, um, you know, like designer clothing and go to underground clubs to listen to music, club no, dance music. So those are your basic tribes. You want to consider which one of those your music videos you're analysing are targeted at. Hey, maybe which one you're into. I like this. These are caricatures from Your Scene Sucks, which is quite amusing. Obviously, these are American subcultures. Um, caricatures but it'd be great if you could do something like this they don't have to be you know cartoons like these are you could take photographs off the internet it could be pictures of you and your mates it doesn't matter but i just love the way that they have you know taken a stereotypical person from that music subculture and annotated them someone like that would look really good as a analysis of who your music video is going to be aimed at try and do one of these yourself Now, we talked last year about how Sarah Thornton in 1995 identified that music magazines are all about creating cultural capital. Um, capital, of course, is something that's got exchange value. It's worth something. So you're basically talking about the fact that one of the things that music videos do is they give the audience knowledge. You know, what the latest, coolest dance routines are you know, what the latest fashions in that music scene are, how to behave, how to walk, how to talk. You know, people in subcultures will try to emulate their heroes. They will dress like them, they will have the same haircut, they will wear the same makeup, they will do the same dance steps, they will affect the same attitude. So, basically music videos are there to teach the audience how to be cool. And they help us to create a sense of an ideal self. Remember Carl Rogers' theory from 1961? The media can help to create role models which we use to shape our ideal self. Everyone has an ideal self in their head. Now, Carl Rogers never talked about ideal partner. This is something we extrapolate from the sense of an ideal self. If you can have an ideal self, surely you can have an ideal partner, an ideal sexual or romantic partner obviously especially nowadays there's no such thing as an ugly pop star they used to be but not anymore they are as much sex symbols as anything else so you are being presented especially for women you're presented this sexual romantic ideal Um, this is an interesting one. This one specifically relates to teenage girls and their relationship to pop music. Definitely, this is definitely in relation to your tween kind of stuff. Think about your One Direction kind of thing, Union J, whatever, right? 
Paul Willis back in 1990 said that pop stars are symbolic vehicles with which young women understand themselves more fully, shaping their personalities to fit the star's alleged preferences. In other words, pop stars are aspirational role models for young women. Um, you know, you will have a female pop star, you will look up to her, you will want to be like her, you will want to dress like her, you will copy her style. Um, the ultimate example of this was Madonna back in the 80s. Um, she's one of the reasons she was so popular is because her fashion style, what they call this thrift store chic, was really easy to replicate by going to second-hand shops. On the other hand of that, you've got the non-threatening boy. So when you look at your typical boy band, they are attractive but not sexual, not very often anyway. So the young girls who are into these bands can look up to these boys. They can imagine having them as boyfriends, but you know it's never going to go beyond holding hands or maybe kissing. They don't have to worry about the, the fear of sex. Women in particular, remember, are very much objectified by music videos in particular. Um, this is where we need to be thinking about your Laura Mulvey male gaze theory. Um, so women are very much objectified. They're turned into sex objects. So objectification, as we can see here, is a, a central feminist theory. It can roughly be defined as seeing and or treating a person, usually a woman, as an object, usually a sex object rather than a person. Voyeurism, very big part of music videos. Scopophilia is another word from this, from scope, scope to look, philia to love. So <clears throat> a voyeur is someone who gains sexual pleasure from watching others when they're naked engaged in sexual activity. Basically, though, voyeurism is the, the, the fundamental foundation, the basis of all media. You know, we are watching other people. I mean, the ultimate example of this goes to reality TV shows. But music videos are full of voyeurism, watching other people on screen, through binoculars, through telescopes, you know, just watching all the time. Um, obviously women again very much objectified that music videos are very much full of naked women you know for a, a heterosexual male gaze which is what Laura Mulvey was talking about in 1975 while she was talking about films she was talking about the female body being objectified in order to provide erotic pleasure for the male viewer um, the use of close-ups in particular low angle shots you know lingering over the woman's body, separating her up into body parts. You know, women are often clad in very scantily, you know, clad clothing, showing a lot of flesh. Okay, most of that you know already, but types of performers. There are different kinds of pop stars according to Sven E. Carlson in 1999. He says that music video artists can be one, commercial exhibitionists, two, televised bards, or three, electronic shaman. Well, what does this mean? Commercial exhibitionists are selling an image, their voice, their face, their lifestyle, records, merchandising, etc. I mean, someone like um, Jay-Z is a perfect example for this. You know, right down to the extent of having their own clothing lines. You know, he's trying to sell you headphones and everything. They're creating an ideal self, a dream of stardom and celebrity. Um, or they can be ideal partners, sex symbols. So this is very common among pop, R&B and rap stars. Their videos tend to em emphasise celebrity lifestyles, material wealth and the star sex appeal. Commercial exhibitionists will include quite often pure performance videos, dance routines in particular, rather than actual, you know, playing your instruments. Um, they show what a good performer the artist is, or artists are. Um, especially important for rock and indie artists. You've got to remember that, you know, if you live in the middle of nowhere in America, your chances of getting to see your favourite band live are slim because they never come anywhere near you. So the only way you ever see them perform live is on music videos. Um, and for rock and indie artists, a lot of their credibility is based on their ability to play live. So it's very important for rock artists to have some element of performance in their music videos. 
The televised bard, the storyteller, someone who narrates a story. Sometimes they will act as a character in the video. I mean, someone like Taylor Swift in her earlier career at least was very much, you know, one of these kind of characters. Um, Ed Sheeran, someone like that. The visuals in the video will often illustrate the the story of the song, sometimes literally, sometimes symbolically. These kind of artists will often use narrative or hybrid narrative performance videos. The Electronic Shaman, a um, perfect example of this would be something like Daft Punk, sometimes completely invisible, you know, you never see their face. Um, or if not, they try to play it down. You know, you typically, you, you know, DJs in particular, dance music is quite often for the the artist to be, you know, almost unrecognisable. You just don't even, you know, they're barely in the video. Uh, only their voice or the actual music anchors the video. Um, it promises that there's a hidden meaning in everything, or you can get your own meaning out of something. They're not as obvious as some of the other kinds of music videos. Um, they're often a lot more arty. They may use much more avant-garde filmmaking techniques. Um, the videos will often be abstract or strange. I mean, you want to see strange, try watching some videos from someone like Aphex Twin or Autica. Um, you know, that's strange. Great, but strange. Now, we need to think of generic codes and conventions. Andrew Goodwin here in 1992. He talked about genre-related style and the iconography that's present in your music videos. Obviously, the things you expect to see in a music video will depend heavily on what genre of music it is. Whatever you're going to have, though, you're going to have lots of close-ups of the main artist or vocalist, unless I suppose they're electronic shaman. Um, because one of the main things music videos does and particularly nowadays, is that they're about creating a star image and promoting a recognisable brand image for that artist. Don't forget, especially with female artists, that voyeurism, scopophilia, the male gaze is going to be a very major part of their star image. So, quick glossary of the theories you're going to need to be talking about. Richard Dyer in 1977, in groups and out groups. Um, Obviously, uh, Walter Lippmann, 1922, uh, subcultures, not subcultures, stereotypes. We've got Sarah Thornton, 1995, subcultural capital. Paul Willis, 1990, that only applies to pop music. So, you know, if you're looking at, you know, I know, someone like One Direction. Sven Carlson, 1999, commercial exhibitionist, televised bath, electronic shaman. And Andrew Goodwin, which is looking at generic iconography, close-ups and voyeurism and music videos. We're... It actually applies. You want to be using as many of these as you can. Um, most of you probably aren't going to be using Paul Willis, but the rest of them are going to be applicable to pretty much everybody's music videos that you're analysing. So I want to hear about all of these in your textual analysis. As always, I've gone through this pretty quick, but if you want any more detail, come and see me or whoever happens to be teaching you. And talk to you again on our next video.